picture of what's going on in the Netherlands. And it's great to see that there is all this uh, progress being made uh, in terms of climate action in, in the water sector. And so what we've been doing is kind of taking a look at what's going on across the globe uh, in terms of climate action, but we don't want to forget what's happening here locally in New York City. So we have uh, Andrea Parker uh, here to tell us about what Gowanus Canal Conservancy is doing. Uh, and Stefan, you had mentioned some of this work uh, in terms of climate resiliency and, and saving every drop. And the the Gowanus neighborhood of, of Brooklyn in New York is in a, is in a somewhat unique situation uh, that that relates to that. So. Andrea, do you want to tell us a little bit about um, the work that you guys are doing and uh, how uh, that relates to, to climate resiliency? And, and men Stefan also mentioned stakeholders, and you guys are doing an excellent job in engaging probably the, some the, the most important stakeholders, which is the community. Yeah, thank you, Jose. Um, and thanks, everyone, for having me here today. Um, I actually just looking at Stefan's first slide, it's funny how wet um, his was and how wet this is. And actually the initial settlers that thought this might be a good place for a city were Dutch. So <laughs> it's full circle here. Um, so the Gowanus Canal is one of the dirtiest water bodies in the United States. Um, it was prior to an industrial canal, it was a massive salt marsh. Um, oysters the size of dinner plates, extraordinarily robust ecosystem, and it was fed by all of these freshwater creeks running down the hills. Um, it was first, um, uh, you know, colonized by the Dutch to, um, to actually build mill ponds and mills. Um, and then in the 1860s, it was channelized into an industrial canal. So we're currently going through a massive Superfund process to clean out the industrial contaminants from the canal. However, the hydrological issues here are uh, complex, massive, and are going to continue to get worse as the climate changes, as both the sea and the groundwater rise and precipitation become more intense. Um, additionally, we're facing a, um, a lot of development pressure, uh, a lot of specifically uh, new residential real estate um, is coming to the neighborhood and is being Right now, the city is proposing a large scale rezoning that will change land use to allow this, but also is a chance to get better policy and funding in place for a, a better hydrology. Uh, next slide. So as many folks have talked about, we're really looking at how an integrated water management strategy could be um, required and integrated into new development as well as existing um, buildings and spaces. So the city is, so the, the, the largest uh, ongoing pollution issue is the combined sewage overflow. Um, essentially every time it rains, 300 or about every year, it's about 263 million gallons of sewage go into the canal. Um, and it's difficult to actually build green infrastructure to manage this in this low lying area because of the high groundwater table. The city is uh, building two massive sewage tanks to help deal with this, but we're additionally looking at all of these sort of ways that can be integrated into both new buildings, um, into newly constructed streets that are going to be reconstructed as the neighborhood changes, and then specifically into um, waterfront public space to both retain and clean water, but also to reintroduce that fresh water flow um, back into the canal, which will you know, both bolster habitat, uh, help push out some of the sewage and limit the amount of water that we're putting back in the overburdened sewer system. Uh, next slide. Um, really, really key to our approach here is um, advocating for net zero CSO development. So essentially any new development that comes into the neighborhood should not add sewage to the problem. Um, so on the left here, right now, you know, we have, we have low rise buildings that are not contributing a lot of sewage to the system, but are contributing a lot of stormwater. Um, the city currently has stormwater rules that will help mitigate some of that stormwater overflow, but there will be a lot more sewage into the system. So what we're fighting for right now is either a district scale, um, requirement for all new development to, um, 
you know, retain, treat, um, or, or hold for periods of time um, their sewage to, so to not overburden the sewer system. Um, so we've been finding this on the district scale. The city of New York is now um, developing a unified stormwater rule that is actually going to get us close to this across the city. Um, this is literally being written right now. Um, so this will be something to watch over the next couple of months about how, how, it, what, how the modeling um, really flushes out and whether it, it meets this net zero um, goal that we have. Uh, next slide. So those are, I mean, obviously this is, you know, with all of these projects and sites, there's enormous amount to talk about and not enough time in three minutes. Um, but just wanted to touch briefly on kind of the, the other work that we do in addition to the design and advocacy, we do a lot of community engagement, specifically thinking about how to get the next generation um, to understand these water issues and really take ownership of them and see what the career possibilities are. So these are students who have just gone through our green infrastructure design challenge, where they design green infrastructure for their school sheds um, to capture all of the stormwater that falls. Um, we are continuing to sort of build out these programs to get kids in the neighborhood to both advocate for water saving and uh, conservation and green infrastructure today, but also to think about how they're going to face the challenges that we will all be seeing in the coming decades. Um, that's all. Thanks so much for having me.